A warm welcome tonight to the second lecture of the 60th anniversary presidential lecture series on technology and the human future. And we have, I see we have some faculty here, some students here, some alumni here, uh, some trustees here, some members of staff and faculty. So we decided to hold this series appropriate enough online, appropriate enough online so that people could join from all over the world in our extended community. Last time I was in LA and the speaker was in Paris. This time I'm back in Paris and our speaker, Dr. Uh, Indyrkia is with us here from Krakow, Poland tonight. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I'm gonna say just a few framing words about the series for those of you who are joining us at the second lecture of the series so that you can have a kind of frame for it. And then I'm gonna introduce our speaker and then Dr. Indurkia will take the Zoom floor. If you have any questions while he is speaking, please put them directly in the chat. I'll begin with those just as he finishes. And then Chiara Amor from my office will help me, will recognize raised hands and will fold in the questions uh, afterward. So the purpose of this series of lectures in AUP's 60th year, as we open an exciting new Master of Science in Human Rights and Data Science, is to create a platform for an important discussion about, a ra about the rapidly expanding role of technology in human life, and to consider at once both the consequences of unregulated technology and the potential that we human beings have to marshal technology for good. The Academy has long been interested in this set of questions, which are never simple and black and white, good and bad, but rather nuanced and interconnected. I believe that universities can and must be players in this critical debate. How do we as scholars and teachers and students consider the ethical dimensions of, arguably, the greatest force that's currently impacting our lives? How do we validate and communicate the frameworks and policy recommendations to guide technologists and lawmakers. Some scholars, as all of you know, are fairly pessimistic that the flood of information to which we are currently subjected will gradually and inexorably efface what is known as private life and irreversibly undermine our liberties. But others believe that we must and can yoke the technological revolution to the protection of human beings and the planet, the transformation of education, the preservation and enhancement of work, the expansion of diversity and inclusion, the protection of the environment, a renewed politics of public health, to give just a few examples, all of these scaffolded by ethical controls and good governance to improve our chances of attaining a better human future. So in this series, I've actually asked each speaker to consider both the theoretical analysis of the potentially dangerous impacts of technology on the human future and practices in which they themselves have been engaged or which they have studied that direct technology's power toward achieving important human goals to unleash creativity and disruption within traditional markets, to engage data, to diminish human rights abuses, to drive activism and social change, to reduce racial and gender violence and economic inequality, and to strengthen our struggling democracies. So it is a great pleasure today to introduce you to our featured speaker, who is a true cosmopolitan and Renaissance man. Dr. Indurkia's 1992 book, Metaphor and Cognition, secured him a place at the crossroads of cognitive science, psychology, artificial intelligence, linguistics, engineering, and human creativity. Having begun with degrees in electrical engineering in the Netherlands and in India, he did his doctorate in computer science at UMass Amherst under the supervision of the cybernetics legend, Michel Arbib. Vipin is, like all of us, a true global explorer. He speaks Hindi, English, Japanese, and Polish, and has worked at universities around the globe, notably in Japan, in India, in the Netherlands, Turkey, and the US, where he taught at BU, at Northeastern, and at Tufts. He is currently professor of cognitive science at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, and he's an expert knitter and hand weaves fractal fabrics. A remarkable set of a remarkable set of details about your hobbies. Dr. Indurkia has long been interested in human interactions with machines and technology, and he's a leading theorist in the field of social robotics. 
Here are some of the questions that he will address tonight. What in fact draws human beings to machines? What kinds of engagements and relationships do human beings entertain with electronic and digital objects? From anthropomorphic toys and robots to screens, smartphones, and conversation agents. What emotional and affective connections do human beings develop with these human emulations? He's going to tell us tonight about the ELISA experiment and phenomenon, an early chatbot, and I mean early, 1964, that emulated a psychotherapist. And he and we will consider the vast possibilities and ethical limits of human interaction with robots. So to the gathered members of the AUP community, thank you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to hand the mic to Bipin Indurkia. And please put your questions in the chat. Over to you, Professor. Okay, uh, thank you, Celeste, for a, a very uh, yeah, honorific introduction. I'm humbled. Uh, I, it's really my pleasure to be here. And I should say, I really was hoping to do this in, in person, but well, there's some also advantages of doing it online because people from far away places can join us. Uh, okay, so having said that, let me start through my presentation. And one second, I have to fix this in a minute. Yeah. One minute. Okay, one second, I close it. Okay. And uh, okay, now now we are good. You see my screen, right? You you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So, well, okay, this is the first slide. It's, I took a, a James Bond theme, mostly because I want to follow the structure of, you all know, on all James Bond movies, they start with a pre-credit sequence. So I'm going to start my, uh, let me close this. Yeah, so I'm going to start my talk with a pre-credit sequence. So here it comes. So what do you do with these women? You just get up out of bed and leave? Sure. Well, explain to me how you do it. What do you say? Just have an early meeting, early haircut, early squash game. You don't play squash. I don't know that. They just met me. That's disgusting. I know. I feel terrible. You know, I'm so glad I never got involved with you. I just would have ended up being some woman you had to get up out of bed and leave at 3 o'clock in the morning and go clean your and irons. And you don't even have a fireplace. Not that I would know this. Why are you getting so upset? This is not about you. Yes, it is. You are a human affront to all women, and I am a woman. Hey, I don't feel great about this, but I don't hear anyone complaining. Of course not. You're out the door too fast. I think they have an okay time. How do you know? I mean, how do I know I know? Because they... Yes, because they... How do you know that they're really... What are you saying? That they fake orgasm? It's possible. Get out of here. Why? Most women at one time or another have faked it. Well, they haven't faked it with me. How do you know? Because I know. Oh. Right. right. I forgot. You're a man. What is that supposed to mean? Nothing. It's just that all men are sure it never happens to them, and most women at one time or another have done it, so you do the math. I think that I can tell the difference. Oh. Oh. You okay? Oh. Oh God. Ooh. Oh God. Oh. 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 Oh God. Oh, yeah, right there. Oh, 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 God, oh, yes, 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 oh, 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 yes, 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 oh, yes, 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 oh, 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 oh 
god. Oh. I'll have what she's having. Okay, so well, that was my pre-credit sequence. You saw the uh, faking of emotions uh, uh, by human, and I'll talk now about uh, faking emotions by robots and chatbots. Okay, so that's my now uh, credit. Okay, okay. So give you a little bit of history of uh, faking emotions and uh, what Celeste talked about um, this Eliza program. So um, in the 1960s, actually, um, Celeste had the exact date, it's 1964, actually. Um, Joseph Weizenbaum, uh, he wrote a simple conversation program called ELIZA. And uh, this program used a very simple um, keyword-based algorithm to carry out the conversation. Now you have to remember, this was like 64, the computers were uh, relatively new, they were big clunky things and uh, and you know, like even like one K of memory was huge. And if you are, if you wrote a larger program, you have to break it into smaller chunks and they used to be called overlays. And anyway, it was very complicated to write uh, uh, programs, you know, and, uh, and he wrote this program. Um, of course, I don't know what was in his mind, but more or less like a spoof actually. He, he was trying to sh uh, say or show what you can do by actually not understanding anything, but by just using some simple tricks. And I'll show you actually uh, some examples of, of some simple tricks he used in his program. So this is a sample uh, conversation with Eliza. Uh, so these, uh, I, I hope you can see my uh, arrow, my pointer. So these are um, um, state uh, like sentences, uh, text uh, typed by the user, and this is the response by the computer or the ELIZA program. Um, now, this program actually used, uh, it did not do any understanding or does not, did not even parse the um, a, a sentence properly. It, it's what did we call technically shallow parsing. Uh, just like give, I'll give an example. So in this case, uh, user typed in, men are all alike. You could say it's, uh, I mean, you could guess that it's a woman who typed this and the computer, uh, the ELIZA program outputs in what way? So actually all it does is that it, it has four words and it recognizes the word all. All is a keyword and it has a simple rule that if, uh, if all is in the sentence, then you just type output in what way, okay? You could have said, oh, it's all dark or I am all alone and whatever, and it will just say in what way, okay? Uh, next, the user types in, um, sorry, there's something in here. Okay, well, sorry, it's a little, okay. So um, then uh, they are always bugging us about something or other. Um, here, the keyword is always. So again, it ignores everything else and the keyword is always. So it, it, this is like a whole sentence is a canned response. It's like one with string, uh, for the computer. It's not uh, like constructing that sentence. Uh, can you think of a specific example? Now, actually the both all and always, they trigger the same rule actually. So it has another little heuristic built in, which is that if, uh, if the same rule is triggered, then it has like a few responses for each rule and always don't repeat the same response. Like if it, for example, if the user said men are, men are all alike and the Eliza said in what way, they are always bugging us about something or other, in what way, it becomes repetitive and boring, you know? So it just uses a different response. And again, notice that it could be swapped. A men are all alike. And can you think of a specific example? They are always bugging us about something or other, in what way, that would also make sense. So this is just randomly one response is chosen, another response is chosen here. Um, here is another simple heuristic it uses, which is to actually, um, spit the sentence back at you by just changing the pronoun. So it has some simple recognizer of personal pronouns. So for example, my and me, and here what it does is it removed this well and just took the same sentence and just replaced my with your and me with you. And then, uh, you know, echoed the sentence back at the user. Your, your boyfriend made you come here. Um, here is another example of keyword thing. So the keyword here is depressed and depressed is tagged as a negative emotion word. So again, it ignores everything else here and depressed. I mean, you could have said, 
he says, I'm not depressed much of the time. It would make no difference because it would just notice the word depressed. And the canned response comes, I'm sorry to hear you are. And this depressed comes from here. So it recognizes the word that the negative emotion word you use, and then you just uh, write it back. So, uh, I mean, in computer ease, it will be a, like, I'm sorry to hear you are X. And this X is a variable that comes from this previous uh, sentence. And it's true, I'm unhappy. So this is again the same rule that it's a negative emotion word and it's unhappy. And uh, so it just says, do you think coming here will help you not to be? And then this word is taken out from here. And just like the first two uh, uh, exchanges, uh, these two exchanges are also triggered by the same rule. So here you can also notice that we can uh, swap them. So for example, he says, I'm depressed much of the time. The Eliza could say, do you think coming here will help you not to be depressed? Uh, it's true, I am unhappy. I'm sorry to hear you are unhappy, okay? So anyway, uh, I hope this gives you some idea of how very simple rules uh, it was using and the conversation goes on like that. Uh, I sort of have more um, uh, examples, but I think I'll, I, you'd be, I, you get the idea. So I don't wanna spend more time on that. And, uh, and anyway, the thing is that, uh, so when after he wrote the program, what uh, he was actually very surprised that even though it was a very simple program, uh, people uh, spent hours conversing with it. And they told very personal things to the program. And, uh, and even people who knew that it was just a program acted as if talking to a real person when conversing with the program. He recounts an anecdote where his secretary uh, got actually a little bit uh, peeved when he was, he, he was maybe giving her something and then he overlooked her uh, conversation. And uh, it was as if he was like uh, eavesdropping a, a very personal conversation. Okay. So he actually, it was uh, affected him very, um, uh, profoundly, and uh, and actually now we use this uh, well in social robotics we use this Eliza effect term for uh, for anthropomorphization, uh, which basically means that um, humans naturally tend to associate beliefs, goal, perceptions, feelings, desire to objects in their in their environment. And I should say it's not just uh, about Eliza program because I mean people. Uh, like um, young men, they could associate with their motorbike very strongly, or some people associate with their computer. And this association is actually very strong. Like if somebody uh, who really loves their motorbike, they spend you know hours polishing it every day and this stuff like that. If you keep their motorbike and you can measure in their heart that their heartbeat will go up. And so it's not just like, it has a biological effect, you know? Okay, and the same thing with this Eliza effect. So anyway, what happened with uh, Liza after the Liza program that Weizenbaum found it very troubling that people would knowingly and willingly attach themselves uh, emotionally to a program that did not understand everything. And, uh, and based on this experience, he wrote this book on computer power and human reason. Uh, uh, Weizenbaum passed away in 2008. And this is his book. And actually, if you read in the back of the book, uh, I didn't take a quote from there. Uh, it, the, uh, the book, the, the, the blurb about the book is that this is a book about what computers can do, what computers cannot do, and what computers should not do. So focus is on what they should not do. Uh, I'm not sure what he would think about the current, um, you know, how people are attached to their cell phones and stuff like that. But anyway, this book was written in 1976. Okay, so that's one part. A uh, little bit of history. Now I want to go to the uh, revival. Um, in the past 20 years or so, uh, as the you know social robots started to be made, uh, a number of uh, robotic systems, they incorporate um, ELISA-like behavioral interface. And here are some examples. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll give you maybe these three, you know, okay? The Sony and uh, Primo Puel and Power of the Seal. Okay, um, and others, um, yeah, I'll just mention it to you, but I'll, I'll skip them, you know, I'll skip this one. Okay, now I wanna show you this uh, Sony's XDR. Uh, again, I'll show you the video uh, of the Eliza effect. Uh, there's some talk in it, but it's in Japanese. And just to give you the context, context of this. So, so this was in 2003. And uh, basically around uh, in the beginning of like 
2000, uh, a lot of Japanese companies were very interested in uh, develop, I mean, putting up their humanoid robot, like around 2000 or 1990, I forget, the Honda came up with this Asimo robot and they displayed with a lot of pomp and ceremony. And then, then Sony's came up with this XDR. Now this video, this is actually the video I took at a, a trade show in um, Tokyo. And uh, at this trade show, they were first, they first introduced this robot and this robot has some um, interesting features that the announcer was demonstrating. And the features it was demonstrating is like, uh, if the robot falls down, it uh, adjusts its body posture to avoid damage to itself. Okay, and now I want you to look for the Eliza if kind of effects there, which are basically faking emotions, you know. Okay, so I'll show you the video now. <laughs> いつでやるだって。このようさあ、いかがでしょうか。Okay, so you see here that this robot, when it first falls down, it actually, I mean, it, it adjusts its posture and then it could stand up from that position, but it doesn't. It, it like lays down and then the announcer has to tell it twice actually. First, it's, it pretends to not hear and then it says, oh, I fell down, I don't like to fall down. And then when it stands up, it stands up partly and then the announcer has to say again, I stand up properly. And then also you uh, notice this, um, uh, he wipes its uh, brow, you know. Now this is an action that we humans do because I mean, we know if you are in a troublesome situation, you are, you sweat and you don't want the sweat to go into your eyes. So we wipe our uh, like forehead, you know, or our brows. And uh, this robot does it, of course, it doesn't have any sweat or anything. So, uh, so all these are like, uh, you can say, um, programmers have put in their like faking um, emotions part, you know, okay. And just to contrast it, I want to show you. So this is from 2003. <laughs> And look, compare this with Atlas robot. This is from 2016 from um, Boston Dynamics Atlas. It doesn't, it, it does not show any emotion. So you just compare this clip now. They're very similar.
so if you compare the this with the so like this robot shows absolutely no emotions. It like if it falls down, it just gets up from that position. It's like a factory robot basically, and um, and uh, I mean it does not have any. Uh, like if you compare that with the Sony's robot, and the Sony's robot could also do all these things, but on on purpose, it is designed to make uh, the emotional attachments uh, uh, with people, and that's why it kind of fakes uh, fakes emotion. Okay, so. Um, um, now I'll show you another example, uh, it, it, it kind of um, a different kind of example. So I'll show you this picture. Uh, this is a doll, a Primo Puel doll. And um, around, uh, I don't, uh, in the beginning of 2000s, uh, these dolls were, um, uh, some company designed them to, uh, they were supposed to be kind of an interactive toy companion for young single girls in the workforce. Now uh, to say in Japan, you know, there's a lot of, uh, People are very fascinated by uh, technology. They like all kinds of gadgets, and the um, and the corporate life in Japan is very very demanding. Actually, like my former student there, they were telling me when they start working, you know, they go, they take the first train to uh, to work. I mean, when you work in some big company, uh, you take the first train to work, and you come back at the very late at night, almost in the last train. You're tired. You just have a time to take a bath. In Japan, they usually take a bath in the evening, and then they just go to sleep, and then the kind of rat race starts again the next morning. And so, some company thought, well, it would be nice to make this doll for um, you know young single girls that uh, they like to have. Uh, so the doll, it's uh, as you see this picture here. It doesn't do much actually. It just, but it says things like, uh, um, "I love you." Uh, give me a hug. Oh, welcome back. I missed you all day. Things like that, you know. And uh, I don't know. I, I haven't seen it, so maybe it, it vibrates a little bit or something like that. Okay. But now it turned out that uh, so th that was the the intended market, but they were a big hit with elderly people uh, in uh, Japan um, because uh, maybe you know that in uh, Japan is one of the countries where the average age is quite uh, high. And in general, this is all over the world that uh, women typically have a larger lifespan than men. So it's quite common in Japan to find women that are in their hundreds, uh, hundred plus, and they are okay. I mean, their health is okay. And, uh, and uh, they are, uh, and the biggest problem they have is the social contact. They don't have, um, you know, they don't have people to talk to. They're like a lot of their friends have died and families like, you know, maybe, too far removed or whatever. And so they found that this um, uh, these dolls were uh, quite a big hit. These uh, elderly women were buying this and they were, uh, and they supposedly increased their uh, quality of life. Now, this is actually an anecdotal evidence that it increased their quality of life. But I'll show you another example where it actually has been studied. And this is a power of the seal. So I show you part of the seal now, and Okay, so this is the power of the seal, and as you see, it doesn't do much. It uh, moves its neck around. Um, you can hug it. Uh, it it vibrates uh, like so. It's like a, a cat purring, you know. That if you pat a cat, it purrs. And interestingly, though this was introduced about uh, twenty years ago, um, it, it still is there, and nothing has changed in its design. Um, uh, three or four years ago, I was at a talk in Tokyo with the. Uh, 
and um, the, by the person uh, the, who designed this uh, power of the seal. And people asked him that, why did he, they not, did not change their design? And his response was that, why change something that already is working very well? And uh, so the, the thing again is that with this simple uh, uh, design, uh, uh, simple design, uh, there actually uh, 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 many studies on that to show that um, it actually uh, uh, helps in therapy. And uh, in, um, uh, yeah, 10 years, uh, well, now 11 years ago, in 2011, when there was this uh, tsunami in Japan, um, and uh, in, uh, you know, so a lot of people uh, lost their, uh, like, their, their loved ones, and it was a very traumatic experience for many people. And uh, they were, um, and they, uh, of course, for people who died, they died, but the people who were left behind, they had to deal with the loss and all that thing. And uh, they, the Japanese government gave them part of the seal, and that had also a lot of um, a therapeutic effects. So this is one case where uh, there's a lot of research. Uh, I, I just show you three uh, research papers, but if you uh, Google them, you'll find a bunch of them, you know. Um, and uh, the people have been studying how the, so just a very simple design actually uh, helps people um, in therapy, okay? Uh, this again, I'll skip that. This is just a, another example of a robot that is designed. And uh, uh, I just want to show you this last part that um, they designed it that this robot will frown, smile, shrug, yowl for food and do the clever things like a baby to get your attention and make you laugh. And, and they can react to each other, learn from each other. They can even catch a cold. Um, as I should say, uh, several years ago, I gave a talk about this in uh, Romania in Cluj. And, uh, and this was to a bunch of psychologists, uh, including some clinical psychologists. And, and they were seriously asking me because, uh, you know, they said, oh, when you say it catches, it can catch cold, does it really get the virus or something like that. And I said, no, it just, they are just faking it, you know. Uh, you can put some put some rule that if the temperature changes this much to this much, the robot will, the voice will become hoarse and robot will start saying, eh, 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 you know, and something like that. Actually, they did it in, I think Igo has some of these kind of components that were put in there because it, it, it makes people more uh, attached to the robot. They make more emotional contact. And things like that. Okay, so um, so, uh, so so sort of summarizing this part, that um, this kind of incorporating this Eliza-like behavior actually has some uh, positive effect. You know, um, so children and adults uh, feel more comfortable confiding to a, a robotic agent. Agent, and this actually is a, uh, that was uh, observed in this uh, uh, castle mate, uh, Sam the castle mate, which I kind of skipped that example. Uh, I, I don't have videos of that, so I have to. I would have to describe to you by words. But um, so the some of the factors that make um, uh, this interaction um, uh, is smooth is uh, uh, so there are five factors. One is that robot uh, have a benign and non-threatening personality. Um, you know they are uh, they're friendly. They don't. Uh, Theron, you, which actually has a drawback, which I'll talk about it later, a little bit later. Uh, they are user-centered, so the the child or adult, they are. Uh, I mean, it doesn't complain, it doesn't fight with you, it doesn't say, "Oh, I rather go do this." Whatever the user says, it's it follows them. Okay. Um, there's also this anonymity factor that sometimes people feel more comfortable uh, confiding to an uh, anonymous person. Uh, sometimes it's called like travel buddy phenomena that you sit next to somebody when you're traveling and um, and you know you tell them all kinds of things that you would not tell to your friend and um, it's, it has been studied in psychology and there's a novelty factor that the robots are novel so children or adults sometimes feel um, uh, curious about them and they interact with them more than they would feel to uh, interact with a teacher or something like that and finally, there's of course the availability, availability factor because these robots are available all the time. They don't say, oh, I had a hard day at work today. Can, you, can we talk about it tomorrow? You know, They are always there. You just turn them on in the middle of the night or whatever, and they will talk to you, okay? Or they, they interact with you. Um, so the moral of so the second part is that uh, you don't need to do much to make the behavior of a system believable. People are naturally gullible. Um, but we must deliberately design the system's behavior to mimic human behavior. And you saw examples of that, for example, in the Sony's robot and things like that, okay? Um, 
Okay, and, and such systems can sometimes be more effective uh, than a human therapist, okay? So that's some, uh, uh, some advantage of, uh, of that. Uh, but so actually now this is already being uh, used now in, uh, so I, I show you some of the modern ch chatbots. So for example, uh, this replica is an AI driven uh, social chatbot uh, designed by um, Eugenia Kida to mimic a diseased person. Uh, this actually is, I don't know if you saw this Black Mirror series, uh, which are interesting uh, about the, um, like I would say negative aspects of technology. And they are actually uh, quite uh, realistic in the sense that if you look at episodes from three or four years back, uh, they're actually, the technology is already there. It's, it's uh, frightening at what pace the technology is growing now that uh, um, the episodes become obsolete. But anyway, there's one of them, uh, Be Right Back. You can find it on YouTube, actually. It's one of the earlier ones. And they show that a person, um, there's a woman and uh, her husband is very active in social media and he uh, dies in an accident and she's pregnant and she, uh, so she's lonely. And then uh, she, her friend convinces her to buy some surveys where they basically recreate the personality of that uh, her husband based on the social media data. And I have to say nowadays that technology is no longer fictional because you can actually do that, you know, you can, and uh, anyway, so this, uh, uh, um, uh, this rep replica is a, so there's a real chatbot, which is based on the same idea and it can have, it allows emotional communication, showing gratitude, complimenting the user, apologetic and things like that, okay? Um, this is some example of the, uh, chat, uh, I mean, you know, ch chatting with the, this chatbot. Uh, can I ask you a question? I guess you can. Thanks. Where are you from? Right here. I live in your smartphone and things like that. Okay. You can like find these kind of things. Um, there's another uh, chatbot uh, or another modern chatbot, Woobot. Uh, it's an AI driven social chatbot it's based on cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's uh, designed by Alison Darcy. She's a clinical psychologist at Stanford University. It is designed to relieve stress, help with depression, uh, provide therapy and other things like that. Okay. And these are again some examples of the uh, chat by this uh, Woobot. Uh, uh, hi Alex, want to chat? Sure. How are you feeling at the moment? Overwhelmed. I'm uh, pretty stressed out at work. Sorry to hear that, Alex. It has been a stressful time for you lately. Uh, so see, these are these are the things uh, uh, written by a robot, and these are the user response, the one in the green. Okay. And uh, so this is um, there's another one, uh, Mitsuku, uh, which is by Steve Worsvik, uh, AI researchers from UK. And it won the uh, student test prize for several years in a row. Um, uh, yeah, I, I won't talk to more about this student test, which is uh, something which one can debate if it really measures the, um, you know, your intelligence or not. There's a, a paper that uh, Alan Turing wrote, I think, in 1950. Uh, it's a very interesting paper. You can read about it, but a lot of people uh, try to. Um, you know, mimic uh, or design chatbot that could uh, try to fool a human. Uh, basically, the idea is that you chat with the chatbot and you cannot tell if you're chatting with a chatbot or with a person. Okay, so um, that's the Turing test. And uh, so that's one thing. So this is an example of the conversation with, um, with uh, this guy, uh, this chatbot. Okay. Uh, there are also some number of apps that are specifically designed for mental health. So for instance, mood gate, mood tools, thought diary, WhatsApp, and things like that. So I'm not going to go, I just mentioned something to you. And I want to sh 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 tell you a little bit about some of the ethical issues uh, that are now coming up with chatbots. So first I'll show you uh, like basically a, like a laundry list of a few issues. And I wanna examine uh, one and the last part of my talk, I'll take, I'll examine one of them. Uh, will, will should the robots lie or not, okay? And how to show how complex it is. So, so ethical issues, of course, is that who is being served? So of course, if you ask all the companies will say, oh yeah, user is before the business, but that's not really true actually, because of course the businesses have their own interest and they might say that the user before the business, but you really have to look at what exactly is happening, you know? Okay, um, the transparency, this is a very big uh, issue nowadays. Uh, so building trust with the user that, uh, uh, you know, it should be why the, uh, whatever the chatbot is doing or it should be transparent. 
um, prevent abuse um, and uh, this privacy. So it's again that uh, there are of course um, laws for data protection mechanisms, but it's still you know, there's a lot of leakage actually, you know. But these are the issues uh, that we have to be uh, uh, worried about. And there are also some social and legal issues. So like foster dependence, uh, so less in human contact. Um, so this is actually what happens in the Black Mirror episode that this woman, she stops having any contact because she's so much having, she's spending so much time with this uh, um, chatbot, which is her based on her uh, dead husband. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, this is what I mentioned earlier, the positive thing that uh, uh, these uh, robots or chatbots are self-centered, but they also promote um, narcissism that people uh, become self-centered and they don't know how to relate to um, other people. I, I will mention actually, there was a, I read some, uh, some years ago, um, an article about uh, the problem with in China that, uh, you know, in the like 80s and 90s in China, they were following one, uh, one family, one child policy. And according to that, our research that uh, what, uh, what, what had happened was that, so normally, so they had one child and um, uh, the child was, uh, you know, so they'll have one set of parents, two sets of grandparents, all focused on them. And they became so self-centered that uh, later on when they were trying to uh, get married or something, they had a hard, very hard time uh, dealing with another person or sharing things because uh, normally, I mean, we learn, you share with your siblings or with other people. Anyway, so this is one problem with this, when you design this technology to, uh, to, uh, which is self-centered, then it also makes people very much, you know, like uh, they they don't uh, they don't you know, they forget how to communicate, how to negotiate. Uh, liability in case of emotional harm that's a legal issue. That if a robot does or chatbot does something that hurts you, you claim I was emotionally hurt or something like that. And also avoidance of political and moral responsibilities. Uh, so actually, uh, you know, I well, I am a technologist in a way. And uh, some years ago, I was I attended one of these uh, European uh, uh, what, what they call it? they were the EU core group. Uh, it's not no longer there, and uh, uh, but it used to be uh, like a forum for a discussion and networking uh, for the cognitive uh, science or cognitive robotics researchers in Europe. And uh, some years ago, I was attending one uh, such uh, networking session. It was in uh, UK, uh, I think Brighton. And uh, they were very, so it was really focused on these uh, chatbots. And, and I heard very interesting presentation by uh, the social workers. And they were trying to point out that, you know, if we uh, uh, like recognize that these, uh, uh, these robots are useful for, uh, 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 you know, helping people and we uh, recognize that, then it, the government just can wash off their hand. They say, okay, everybody gets power of the seal and now we don't have to deal, uh, deal with it anymore. So, uh, so that's what they were worried about actually. They gave some very interesting presentations about that, how, you know, I mean, it's, it, we, acknowledging that the technology can be helpful, but we cannot like, we, I mean, we cannot just accept that and say, okay, now we have solved the problem because it's not solved, you know. Um, Okay, now I think, as I said, these are some general issues, but I wanna now uh, in the last 10 minutes, I will want to focus on one particular issue just to show how complex it is. Should a, a robot or chatbot lie, okay? And this is again a topic that is a currently hot topic. So I start with like, what are the possible benefits of a lying robot? So in rehabilitation, in therapy, providing emotional support. So think for example, in rehabilitation. So let's say, you know, you have a rehabilitation robot and then uh, you, let's say you had a, uh, some accident and then you were in your leg was in a cast or something and your robot is helping you learn to walk uh, or relearn to walk. And then uh, let's someday you feel bad and you say, oh, I'm doing, doing terrible today. And the robot can say, oh yeah, you're doing 10% worse than yesterday. And that's not, I mean, that's not what a human therapist would do. Uh, here I'll show you an example. This is from my, um, my screenshot of my iPhone. And you see here, so it says that on average you walked and run less this year than you did last year, you know? And uh, this is, uh, so this health app doesn't lie. And you think about it, like here, you know, it's like, oh, 11.1 kilometer per day, that's quite a lot. And, uh, but uh, it's, it's less than the last year. So, I mean, something like that can be 
uh, discouraging because I mean, you know, it, it, if you follow that logic, you're always getting better and better and better. But at some point, you, I mean, you you like top out or something like that. Okay, so. Um, uh, so basically, there are two approaches to lying. Uh, one is like uh, outright social lying, like you are doing great, and uh, another is like what is called tactful lying. And I put a question mark here because some might say, "Well, it's not really lying." The idea here is that you look for something that is positive. So, like for example, in rehabilitation, the person maybe is their pace is slow or something like that, but you find that maybe their posture is better than yesterday. So you try to take their focus, their attention on that. You say, "Oh, your posture." is better than yesterday. But I want to now show you both of them actually have a problem, you know. Uh, so here is a uh, chatbot that does not lie. And this again from a movie, Her. Um, if you, uh, maybe some of you may have known about it, uh, but let me play the clip, okay? So just to give you the context of this guy, he's in love with his uh, chatbot uh, and uh, Samantha. And, and this in this one, he actually finds out, he wonders that, oh, maybe he's having an affair with some other um, uh, people also, and this is what happens in this one, and see what the chat box says. Can you talk to anyone else while we're talking? Yes. Are, are you talking to anyone else right now, and the people or OSs or anything? Yeah. Thousand three hundred sixteen. Love with anyone else? I don't know. Are you? I've been trying to figure out how to talk to you about this. How many others? Six hundred forty-one. Okay, I'll, I'll just stop it here. So you see that, I mean, you know, the one, sometimes when I uh, talk about it to my class, I say, well, just like a poor design because any, uh, I mean, you know, but I'm sure any woman knows that an answer to that question is that, no, you are the only one, you know, but uh, she says 641, but I'll show you, it has actually some positive advantage of doing things like what they did um, in this one. Um, so anyway, so this is a chatbot that does not lie. She's she's having conversation with whatever, I forget, 8,000 and some people, and she's in love with 641 uh, people, okay? Um, so, um, so that uh, the so this lying actually affects trust. You know that's the point I want to make. Like not lying builds trust, and I'll show you this scene in a minute. Uh, and outright lying destroys trust. This was actually explored this idea in a, um, a story by Isaac Asimov in 1941. A story called Liar, and then but and the tactful lying also affects trust. So uh, that's just the thing I want to talk to you about. So here is a, from the same movie. So you saw uh, when in the earlier conversation. She said, uh, well, she's in love with 641 people. And also in, at the time when uh, she asked how many people uh, she's talking to right now, and she said 8,000 or something, I forget the number, but now watch this one. You know? Samantha? Hi, sweetheart. What's going on? Theodore, there's some things I want to tell you. I don't want you to tell me anything. Come lie down with me. Are you talking to anyone else right now? No, just you. I just want to be with you right now.
so so now you see that uh, this time he asks her are you with somebody else right now and she says no i am only talking with you so he he believes her now because of the past um, you know the past interaction you know so this uh, so this is the point about trust actually you know and uh, and this again as i said that uh, there is a very nice story by uh, isaac uh, simov in 1941 called liar in which he actually explored this idea that if a robot um, it tries to tell you things like to make you feel good. Uh, it tells you things that you want to hear, and uh, and it actually uh, it it results in a very, very bad situation actually, and it's the whole thing is disastrous actually. You know, uh, you can read this story and you can find it on the internet. So it's not you know it's uh, so um, so again you know outright lying like uh, uh, it destroys trust. Uh, and uh, but the tactful lying also has problems. So actually, tactful lying is uh, something uh, which uh, people we call it. Uh, you can it relates to what is called nudge theory, and uh, and also in actually another name for it is called shikakeology. And it, especially in last uh, I would say seven or eight years, it has become an interesting area. How to um, basically uh, how to uh, promote or, uh, or yeah promote change of behavior by designing what is called nudges or little things you know uh, and one term for it is called libertarian paternalism so it's a, this is a, a, a quote taken from the book itself a relatively weak soft and non intrusive type of paternalism because choices are not blocked fenced off or uh, significantly burdened and i'll show you there are a lot of examples but i just want to show you one example and also how it, things are not as simple as it seems. So this is actually another book about uh, um, nudge unit, and it talks about this opt-in versus opt-out. So uh, so there is a, a study done that, um, and I forget the name of the country, but uh, some countries in Europe they have a very uh, high uh, rate of organ donors. You know, and some other countries have a very low rate of, uh, of very few organ donors. And people studied that, why is that? It's not like, uh, I mean, the, con the countries look sociologically uh, similar or things like that. And they found out the, the difference is simply uh, this opt-in and opt-out. So the idea is that in this case, uh, um, you, your default is that you're not an organ donor and you have to click to be an organ donor. And opt-out is that by default, you are an organ donor and you have to click to be not to be an organ donor, so you get many organ donors. The point is that uh, you know people uh, click a uh, click is uh, co uh, requires cognitive effort. So whatever is your default option, people go with it. So for example, so this is one of the principles that is uh, uh, explained and it, uh, uh, it it was talked about a lot. Now, actually, if you go uh, 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 like about. Uh, Yes, when these principles came out. So about uh, a, a few years ago, many web services, they started to apply this principle and they started to choose opt out, you know. So like they will say, click here if you do not want to receive our weekly newsletter or whatever, offers or whatever. So the default was opt in, you know. But uh, if you see now uh, in uh, the last two or three years, the, it has shifted towards opt in because um, so uh, many, um, uh, services, they will say, click here if you want to receive our weekly newsletter or whatever, because it increases trust. So people feel, oh, I'm feeling like they are not going to send me junk mail and stuff like that, you know. And actually, they are more likely to click then, or and if they click, they are they doing it consciously and they will actually read it, you know. So so I just want to show you how this, uh, uh, you know, uh, things change. Like what seems uh, good at the uh, at at first. Uh, come, turns out that it's not so good, you know, okay? And also like, uh, you know, this term that you use, benign pattern, uh, this, uh, or libertarian, uh, libertarian paternalism, or I call it benign paternalism, it's actually very uh, easily slips into manipulation. So for example, politic, political campaigning, um, like what do you, I mean, when you nudge people, uh, what do you decide how to nudge them? So you, you all know the case of like Cambridge Analytica, and uh, uh, where they were basically nudging people, you know, to vote in a particular direction. And also advertising is it's a big thing now that in advertising, you are also, you're, you're trying to persuade them, you know. Um, there's actually a lot of literature now on this, uh, uh, I would call it like art of persuasion and science of persuasion because, you know, as you know, advertising is a big business. And uh, so actually this is the, basically what I want to tell you about uh, this, the simple issue about should machines lie 
I mean, uh, initially it looks like a reasonable thing, at least in terms of, uh, um, say, tactful lying, but it's not so simple, you know. And actually, uh, I just want to show you some examples of some recent work on uh, uh, AI and deception, uh, because, uh, uh, well, I, I mostly talk about AI like lying, but there's also this issue about the AI learns by itself to be deceptive because it has some goals and, and for, uh, for example, this one, this paper, this is a recent paper from 2021, uh, Can a Robot Lie? They actually find that um, when um, they did actually uh, like uh, empirical research to show that uh, people apply the same uh, uh, criteria of lying to an artificial agent as they apply to humans, you know? So, um, you know, so uh, so issue is the same actually, you know? And there was a conference on deceptive AI in uh, like 2020 and 2021. So these are the kind of issues that are uh, right now being discussed. And, and then I just want to show you a couple of interesting uh, books that actually this weapons of math destruction and this alignment problem. And uh, they're very interesting. Um, a, a lot of cases studies and examples there about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, some of the issues I talked about and many other issues that I didn't talk about, uh, but hopefully maybe you'll hear some in your other talks in this series. And with that, I uh, and my talk, I started with the James Bond poster. So I had another last one that was a little optimistic, tomorrow never dies. So thank you. And I'll be happy to take your questions. Okay, stop sharing now. <laughs> I think you're more, I think you're muted, Celeste. Sorry, that always happens. Thank you so much for giving us this overview, this kind of history of um, the impact that robots can robots can have in human lives. I confess the other night I opened up my computer and there was a video of a very well-made robot with a with a very human face trying to express human emotions. And I found it extremely disquieting to watch and, and confess to having a lot of ambivalence about this. But there are people on this call who've had much more experience than I with machines and um, human needs, human contact. And maybe a few of them would like to, to ask a question. I'll go to the chat here and follow. Maybe we'll start with Jackson Vam. While Paro seals have improved the lives of lonely seniors and those with dementia, could this trend continue and later either justify uh, decreasing nursing assistance in place of robots or lead to a belief that seniors can solely be placated with robotic interaction? Yeah, so actually this is the point that I touched on when I was talking about this issue that, um, you know, uh, incorporating this technology uh, seems to like politically, it seems to say, okay, we are done, you know, because we have power of the seal. And that's exactly the point that I was trying to raise that we should not uh, accept that, you know. So uh, acknowledging that this technology can be useful, we cannot, uh, as a matter of fact, in this um, the uh, workshop, I was uh, the, the networking meeting I'm talking about, they actually had this. Uh, a survey they asked all of our participants that would you accept a robotic assistant when you are elderly or something like that and uh, they were just trying to get a feeling for that and you know i don't i don't know i have i'm ambivalent about it because i'm a technologist and i recognize that uh, technology can be effective and uh, uh, give you another example again from the same networking meeting there were some uh, social workers uh, uh, who gave a talk and uh, one of them, uh, she was from England and she was saying that, you know, because the, the way they're, uh, when they visit elderly people's house, their time is very tightly controlled because of the insurance thing, like they have to spend half an hour with this person. And then she thinks that in half an hour, uh, they, she has to decide whether I can do dishes of this person or I can talk to them, I can massage them you know, I can clean up their place. I cannot do all of them. So no matter what you do, you always feel inadequate, you know, that you haven't done some other things, you know. So so anyway, so all I'm saying is that um, it's not, um, uh, yeah, I, I, the issue you're raising, I say we should be aware of that. We don't want to uh, say that, okay, the problem is solved because we have some 
uh, power of the seal we give them to say so they are okay now we don't have to deal with it i think we always have to deal with it you know so that's the key thing where do you set the limits you know it's extremely delicate to think about where you where you set that jennifer edwards are there more benefits than consequences to using ai in children's psychotherapy are there trends in children using ai weaning them off of human interaction well, I will say to this, uh, first of all, the, uh, this again, I didn't talk about this uh, Sam the Castle mate, but one of the, uh, because that uh, system was especially designed for children at the MIT Media Lab in like 2003 or something like that. And one of the things that they found out is that the children uh, confide to the, uh, this, uh, in this case, it was not a robot, but a conversation on Asian. And actually, uh, then if you know, one of the problem with the children, uh, communicating with children is to figure out what's happening. So for example, a child may be getting bullied at school and, uh, and, but you don't know, the child doesn't tell you that. And what happens is that you get their bad batting or they are throwing tantrums and they're like eight years old and, and you don't know, you ask them what's happening, you know, everything is good. It's very complicated. So you take them to uh, people take them to doctor and they do test this everything is fine um, people don't always take them to psychologists because there is stigma associated with that but now they found that in a situation like that uh, a chatbot talking to a child child tells them everything you know they, they feel more free telling them so you basically find out what the problem is and then you can try to address that so um but but you know again that's one part but other part i talked about this narcissism that like a child who is always interacting with that they used to get self-centered thing they like in a playground when children play together they know that uh, oh uh, i need this wing oh i need this wing and somebody can bonk them and they fight or things like that so there is some social learning about give and take give and take and the robotic technology can never do that because no matter what you do you don't want the the uh, chatbot or robot to be aggressive you know so so that's uh, so that's the other side of that you know so um yeah so i'll go back to the question that so the question about more benefits you know i don't know i think that there are some benefits and some uh, drawbacks and so again going like the earlier thing we have to watch this very carefully you know uh, it's not like we cannot say oh this is good let's just do it all the way or or this is bad we should ban it i think that now, I think both extremes are bad. So like what Celeste was saying, there's a delicate line, but we have to find it and try it, and we have to keep trying to find it. You know, that's the point. Uh, another thing is that you already see the children, you know, they are so used to the technology and they are, um, you know, I see little uh, toddlers who can hardly walk, but they are good. They, they know how to swipe their things and, you know, and, and they're very confident actually, you know. Uh, and I, I, th I think people are still uh, raising this issue that maybe, uh, they are getting so used to technology that they are not learning uh, uh, human communication skills, you know. So, yeah, so I think maybe I'll don't say more about it. It's some topic we can talk more about it because I see there are a bunch of other questions, you know. There's a lot of questions coming. Ronnie and Cliff uh, Mahler have asked, are there any empathy tests, personal and or technical, that might be used to determine whether true empathy was actually expressed? Is there a way to measure? I, I, I'm understanding that what you're saying is there, is there a way to measure the efficacy of a robot as a therapist, let's say? Yeah, actually, uh, I should say there is a, there's a bunch of uh, uh, measures for that. We actually were working with, uh, uh, two years ago, we were working with some colleagues in Salzburg University on that, how to measure, um, how to measure empathy, empathetic uh, interaction. Uh, with a robot. And actually, I, I think if you look at it nowadays in uh, social sciences, they use another term. They think empathy is not good enough, you know. I forget there's another term that is used. Uh, it's more uh, correct than empathy, you know. Uh, I have to look it up. I, it, uh, the term is not coming. But uh, anyway, yeah, you can measure the uh, but, but the first, of, first of all, I don't know what true empathy is because uh, it's always a degree, you know. We can empathize to more or less uh, uh, to a more or less degree, and it's a matter of how, um, you know, what you want, and and it can also break. Like for example, in this movie, her they did it very nicely. So initially, of course, this guy is in um, love with her and whatever. But after this, uh, the scene on the staircase when she tells him that he has a uh, she, she's in love with 641 other people, and he gets mad. And, and there was a scene in which the later 
um, the, the of course this is social chat bot so it, uh, she's talking with him and her voice chokes and this guy says why are you doing this and she says oh but this is uh, this is what you are supposed to do when you are uh, emotionally upset or something and he she, he says oh you are a chat bot you cannot be emotionally upset something like that you know so the point is that this empathy empathetic interaction is very tricky thing because it can very easily break by robot doing something uh, bad so again the issue is that we, as a, as a designer or, uh, or social roboticist, you have to figure out what is the right level of empathy you want to build in. And I should also mention that there are some people who are uh, completely against that. They think that robots should, one should not design robots to have an empathetic interaction because it's uh, they consider it as morally wrong. We had mm. some uh, issue, views like that, like four or five years ago, I organized the workshop in Krakow on uh, machine and ethics law. And uh, I can, well, I think one is uh, Joanna Bryson. She's a very well-known researcher. Uh, and, and she takes a very strong position on that respect that, uh, uh, she, I mean, if, if you would have her, if she had her way, she would have, uh, like outlaw all kind of social robots that uh, she thinks they are machines and they should look like machines. They should act like machines. They should not do like what I showed you in the Sony's robots, you know? Um, so, so there is uh, this, uh, uh, you know, extreme view that some people take uh, with good reasons, you know? So I'm going to jump around a little because you just mentioned the film Her, which in which there's sort of a romantic robot. Yeah. So Ruth Corrin says, following up on earlier questions and also thinking about the romantic interaction in the film from the romantic chatbot side, what are people in the discipline saying about whether or when AI agents could be considered to have personhood, sense of self, or perhaps even some kinds of rights? Well, the, the rights is a difficult thing because uh, I think that, uh, but I'll say this thing about romanticism and they would, I would refer you to one uh, very good documentary. Uh, uh, it was made by a, a German uh, woman. I think it was last year or recent. I think it was last year or two years ago. It's already 2022. I think it is 2020. It's called High AI. And she, it's, uh, so it has a lot of interviews about the issues you are raising the consciousness and all. But it also uh, it has two case studies. One is of this pepper robot in an elderly home in uh, Japan. And one is, uh, so here what happens is that these elderly people, they're very uh, kind because pepper robot is in a way very, I mean, it's, it's like one of the top robots now, but it's in a way very stupid, like in social interactions, you know. Uh, but they are very benign, they're very kind towards it. They, oh yeah, he's doing this, whatever. But the other case study is of a sex robot in, uh, in uh, US, so there was a guy and so it's a documentary. So they are it's not a film, you know, they are really uh, filming the actual interaction. And uh, so this robot also is in a way very primitive. Uh, and uh, whenever this guy makes some romantic uh, comments to it, the robot doesn't know how to answer it. So it just makes some philosophical observation, but the guy doesn't mind it, this Eliza effect, he just projects these things to it. And, and uh, so this actually another issue that uh, people are raising now that, uh, should the robot be, you know, uh, should, could, can you have like emotional attachment um, uh, with the robots? I think the the rights and issue, I think is a, uh, people talk about it now, but I think it, this will probably come later. Uh, maybe I think the more current uh, issues are like, you know, should we make ro robots to have emotional attachment? Um, like uh, I heard uh, when I was, I was talking to you about this talk I heard in Tokyo, uh, when the, this uh, one of the things I heard was from the guy who designed Paro, but there was another talk by this company. Uh, they make sex dolls actually, so they're not robots. They make sex dolls, and uh, um, and what was very interesting was that uh, in the company culture they were showing that how they really uh, regard these sex dolls as uh, are as like humans. So for example, when a sex doll is retired, they follow almost like a Shinto ceremony to. Uh, to kind of uh, cremate it or something like that, you know? And I think they do it, it's a little bit like, uh, in a way it sounds silly, but it has this, uh, you know, like uh, in, uh, uh, I do also this user experience design. So nowadays in you, when you're designing something, you create a persona, you know? So even though you're creating an object, you create a, a fictitious user. And somehow if you, if you design having a persona in mind, you get more realistic design than uh, just designing for an abstract user. So they are trying to apply that to this uh, sex doll design, you know, so treating the, in this case, not the user, but the doll as a person. And, and then they think that they will produce uh, 
to produce better dolls. So, uh, so I think the yeah the so I, so I would say the rights is the more uh, uh, like a little bit too far. Uh, I think they're more because uh, yeah the like take autonomous cars. I mean you know the issue is that if it hurts somebody. Uh, who is responsible? Is the company responsible? Is the uh, I mean, you know, the car doesn't have any uh, right in a legally. Uh, people in legally, they are talking about these things. So, like, if your social robot hurts you, for example, uh, who is responsible? Because uh, I mean, social robot doesn't have any like. It's not a corporation, or it does not. It's not a legal entity, you know. So you cannot sue it or something. The only person you can sue it is the company that sold you the robot or something like that, or provide you the contract, you know. So this I'm is a good point sure. for me to ask if anybody wants to respond to what, what <laughs> Professor Indurkia just said, or, or anybody would like to jump in here. And otherwise I'll just continue reading these excellent questions, but would anybody like to say anything about, about this? Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on to Georgi Stojanov's question. How plausible is it that humans, us, are qualitatively not that different from a super duper Eliza robot? The consequence will be that we'll deal with this new technology just the same way we deal with each other. Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, I also say to people that, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the times we are also like Eliza, like if you talk to your, um, I mean, if you, some of you have young children, when you talk to your young children, you talk like Eliza, like where you half listen to them and you say whatever, whatever to continue the conversation. Sometimes with partners also people do it, like they are not paying full attention. Uh, and also, you know, this emotional part is another thing that um, like in philosophy, there's a lot of uh, literature on, well, can robots have emotions and not? And I ask, well, what's a real emotion? Like uh, if, if an actor is playing a role, do they have a real emotion? Uh, some actors are better than others. Uh, some play with this, uh, what is called, you know, you get into the skin of the role that you are playing and uh, things like that. Or somebody sometimes we fake emotions like you saw in the movie clip I showed, but that's not very, um, that's very realistic movie clip, I'm sure. Uh, you must have experiences like that. But little kids, they throw, they throw, oh, wah, wah. they need some uh, candy or something like that. They make a bigger deal about it than it needs to be just because they 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 figure that mom and dad will uh, see their tears and they'll buy them the candy or the toy or something like that. That's a little bit like faking emotions, you know? So, so yeah, I, so I say that we, you know, we humans are also like that. So actually the, I think that, uh, what Georgi is asking, I would say that yes, uh, in a way, uh, when we deal with these issues with social robots, I think it also reflects back on our human to human relationships as well that uh, we can, uh, I mean, uh, we have to like uh, consider that and I think in a way, uh, they, they feed on each other, you know, they redefine our human to human relationships and in turn, uh, they help us to uh, redesign or design the social robots better to have this. So I think it's possible that in a future society, there will be like these, uh, because these issues will feed on each other. So we'll get into society when we are, our habits have changed because of the social robots and social robots have also changed because of the, uh, the way the humans and uh, humans interact with each other. So Susan Perry has come back with an answer uh, to Ruth Corrin that the EU Parliament is actually working on the articulation of electronic personhood in terms of rights and liability. Um, and maybe you want to say a word or two, Susan, about it, what that means to you and what the limitations of that might be. And then we'll come back to some questions about what is the way forward in a world where human beings appear both gullible and very needy and willing to be satisfied with electronic communication that is at best kind of a recognition of your personhood and, um, and, and a mirroring of, of things that you've said. So Susan, would you like to say a few words? Well, first of all, Bipin, hello. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. That was wonderfully interesting. I just loved it. And interestingly, today I started my teaching semester and our class was on the difference between liability and natural rights, so legal rights and natural rights. And the conundrum that, that as lawmakers, uh, that lawmakers find themselves in trying to determine how to approach this. Um, because artificial intelligence isn't human, there was a reluctance to use a human rights framework. And mm -hmm. so there's a risk-based 
framework that's being used, which is a series of prohibitions followed by high risk AI that has a whole series, of, a whole procedure that one has to go through in order to register algorithms, uh, check them on a regular basis to make sure that we do no harm. But there's another group in the European Union, European Union Parliament that's pushing for electronic personhood, like we have corporate personhood, uh, mm -hmm. nature sure. even, that some people are talking about that, animal rights, et cetera. It's an interesting group of people. They're very well informed and electronic personhood would um, be a game changer, I think. Uh, and I don't know what to expect, but I think these are interesting discussions that are going on. Yeah, thank, thank you, Susan. You. Yeah, that's very uh, helpful. Yeah, thank you for this comment. Claudia, you just popped in. Would you like to say something too? This is a faculty, you probably know each yeah, other, but a faculty member. Yeah, we know. Hi, Bibi. Human computer interaction. <laughs> Hi, Claudia. Hi. Uh, I just want to pick up on uh, Susan's comment that we were in the same classroom. And so we, we the, the main discussion, and I, I actually wonder what you think, Bibi, is. Um, the, the problem to me is the problem of delegation of responsibilities. The moment in which you recognize personhood to a machine, we already do it now. Okay, yeah. we say, oh, the computer did it. And, and we, because the computer did it, it's, that's the way it should be done, right? It's the decision that should be made. Sure, sure, we do yeah. it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the problem would get even worse the moment that we give pe personhood to um, to machines, uh, because at that point, the human would feel even more allowed to mm -hmm. give up responsibility. And, uh, and this giving up of responsibilities in situation, we can think of judges making decisions, sure, sure, yeah. people who employ uh, employers who have to make decisions. So what, what's your standing? I'm, I'm really curious since you're so much in depth into this problem. Yeah, actually, you know, I, I've been uh, reading this book, uh, The Alignment Problem, the one uh, book that I mentioned. And uh, actually, I found it in Georgi's office when I was, it was Ruth's book. And uh, I borrowed it and then I bought a copy myself. And, uh, and it's very interesting because it actually, yeah, it, it raises uh, some of these questions that you were asking that how um, yeah, so people tend to say, okay, this, uh, um, you know, the program decided that, uh, but that's not good, actually, and this is where this transparency issue comes in, actually, because, you know, um, the, uh, if the program decides that, well, why did it decide that, and, uh, and people tend to just say, okay, I don't know, but somehow, um, uh, you know, we trust it, but we, we do keep, we, I mean, they show a lot of examples that you cannot trust the, this kind of thing, because sometimes the data is biased, sometimes the data is wrong, and uh, so, so I think that, um, uh, especially like this, uh, the alignment problem book and the work of this uh, Cathy O'Neill on um, um, weapons of math destruction, the title is a little bit provocative, but I think inside it, she has a lot of very interesting examples to show that, um, I think that, uh, as you know, that now already in the uh, things are changing. So in a lot of, there are a lot of centers around the world about ethics and AI, which they involve uh, legal scholars and social scientists. And so I think this, we need to have a debate with, uh, I mean, it used to be before, like if you look at the, until like five or six years ago, all AI was all technologists actually. They were just doing technology, technology. They were solving this problem. Let's uh, beat uh, Go player, let's beat chess player or whatever, beat Jeopardy. But now because, uh, uh, partly because AI has become uh, it deployable and it's being deployed in a lot of uh, situations. So it's actually affecting us in real way. You know, it's no longer in the lab because if you look in the 80s and 90s, all these AI systems, like even the ELISA program, with it was not deployed actually, just some conversation pieces they had, you know, and people used it. But now uh, we, we are, uh, I mean, we are using it all the time. And so, so I think that, um, yeah, I'm, in a way, all I'm saying is that I don't have an answer to that. But um, the good thing is that the, I think the dialogue is happening between social scientists, legal scholars, and, and technologists. And I think we need to do more of that, you know. And I think this uh, lectures that Celeste organized is, I think, one step in that direction. So that's very nice, I think. Great. And I'm going to ask you and Georgi to tell us more about the Replica Project, because he has written about the Replica Project.
We have an echo problem. Somebody needs to put themselves on mute here. Okay. Yes, I did. Uh, that okay. was me. Yes, I... <laughs> Georgi, you want to? Did you want to maybe repeat this this uh, comment that you made about the replica? Yes, and then... Uh, uh, comment yes, that you made about um, yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, I don't know how to. So, yes, I don't know how maybe to to get out of this echo. Get out of this echo. Yeah, I think we can hear you. You know. Yeah, maybe a bit better. Yeah, it's better this, now. Yeah, it's better now. Oh, okay. um, there is some delay, but uh, I, in, anyways, I'll continue, and you'll hear me with about five seconds of delay. So uh, that was an interesting discussion, Susan, uh, Claudia, and Ruth there. And my, my point here is exactly uh, sort of, it supports the hypothesis that I put there, that we are not that much uh, different for a very complex ELISA-like robot. And uh, just to see how the lines are being blurred, uh, there is a, activist, British activist, Caitlin Richardson, and she is leading a campaign to ban sex robots uh, because in some way she says that's a dehumanizing and we know that they're not humans, but still in the perception of humans, that's dehumanizing. So uh, that th there was an interesting discussion. She was at the conference that we, with Vipin, we organized on ethics at Stanford a couple of years ago. She was there and she was quite vociferous in uh, her expressing her convictions and, 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 and everything. And I remember one question, oh, sorry, one uh, comment from that conference was, uh, would you be more comfortable if these uh, the sex dolls or robots or people uh, have the ability to sometimes say no? Uh, I found it, I mean, uh, quite uh, amusing, but intriguing as well. Uh, if, uh, the, so I, I don't know how well is this passing through the my my my, my talk. You're muted, Celeste. It's very tough because there's such an echo that it's very oh, yeah. difficult for us to follow. Let let me try. Uh, with one. Uh, I'll try. I'll try again. Just just a second. So just a second comment on the, and, and I'll try. You're frozen now, Georgi. Okay, now, I believe now it's better. I believe now it's better. We still have echo, Still echoing. Still echoing. I'm going to move well, to another. I'm going to move. I'll, I'll just write it in the chat. Okay. Okay. So I want to end with uh, the, the last, uh, the last comment, actually, which I think is fascinating and kind of raises issues uh, right in alignment with what we're talking about now. We've been talking from one perspective about how the ELISA effect can actually bring emotional succor and support yeah. to older people to to people who are suffering um but uh this this last person david de, de la palme has said the current pandemic has pushed professionals to use video like zoom sessions with clients technology came to the rescue of psychology especially in these times of instability 
-hmm. I use it extensively. However, the quality of the therapeutic relationship has suffered in terms of experiencing and sharing. So here's a comment from the other side of that, which is to say um, those those therapists who needed to use technological means during this time of the pandemic have done so, but at least one here is registering a sense of a loss of um, empathy and sharing. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, actually, I, I completely agree with that because I have to say it's my personal, I'm a face-to-face -face person and I really like, I enjoy classes in person. I don't, uh, I mean, like I, I had to do it on Zoom for a year and they were really, uh, I could do it, but it's not my style. And I, so I, I, I completely agree. But also I should say that one thing that puzzles me is that uh, especially with the younger generation that uh, they are so much used to the technological things. I see, for example, people sitting in the restaurant and they are, uh, you know, I can show you they, their interaction consists on, you know, they show it to their partner and somebody does this thing, they show it to their partner. They're not talking, you know, and uh, they are each uh, like lost in their own devices, you know. Uh, and I'm sure you know uh, there are a lot of these things, and and I think that is especially uh, true of the younger generation because they grew up with this technology and they are. So I yeah I don't know I wonder about it. Like uh, personally, I agree. I think that um, this uh, I mean technology is there, so in a way we can connect with people far away. And like even for my talk, I mean people from far away places can participate, which is nice. But the other thing, I really pr prefer to do it in person, actually, you know, then we can see faces and, and get feedback on that. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, like the, I, I'm thinking, acknowledging that loss of a relationship. And, and I think that, um, again, I, I really don't know how if it will um, change, you know, that there are I don't know what the current status is, but there were some companies that were making this uh, holographic, uh, holo uh, holographic images kind of communication possible or things like that. So um, uh, it, this is like a stuff of science fiction a little bit, and uh, and uh, but I don't know. I'm so I'm 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 with uh, David, you know. <laughs> okay, that I acknowledge <laughs> that it's a hard thing, and uh, and it's not all hunky dory, you know. That's all I would say. Well, as, as with the, I think one of the things we all know about technology at this point is, you know, we love it and we hate it. And so far we have not been able to come up with um, any kind of clear idea about these guides, but really a kind of call to action to begin to talk about these things and to come up with guidance that would help us marshal the benefits of it, harness the benefits of it, but not, uh, you know, retreat to a world where all of us are only interacting with machines. So we're so grateful to you for showing us some of these examples, putting this on the on the table for us. Yeah, I make this one brief comment. I noticed that this is the point that uh, Johanna saved to raise that uh, yeah. that, you know, that, so I, I, I'm just re 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 e echoing your point that I think that uh, the important thing is that we have to engage in dialogue and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and dialogue between technologists and, and uh, legal scholars and social scientists. And I'm like the kind of books that I mentioned that I think that it is happening. Uh, perhaps some of us would like to see it in a more accelerated pace, which myself included, but the good thing is that it is happening and we all can contribute by accelerating the pace of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank That's you very much. It's, uh, we invite everybody to tune in for the rest of the lectures, which will be happening at a ra rather rapid pace now. Georgi Stojanov will be talking next week about privacy, -ish, I think. Um, and then after that, we're gonna have a lot in, in fast sequence and we look forward to seeing all of you again. Vast range of topics, human rights, liberal education, algorithms, um, and we, we look forward to, to having you join us again. And Bipin, thank you so much for being our guest tonight and sharing. Well, thank you. It was my great pleasure. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. See you Bye. next time. Bye.